What has happened today is extremely serious and it is, of course, unprecedented. You know, it's a crisis, but it's also a real opportunity to set up a mechanism where if a junior court assistant is harassed by the Chief Justice of India or if an intern is harassed by a Supreme Court judge, then there is that confidence that the young person has that as a citizen, their bodily integrity means as much as anyone else's. We have to start with the premise that prima facie, we have to believe what the woman is saying. I think if anything, if the Me Too movement has taught us anything, it has taught us this, that Prima facie, believe the woman. And I say prima facie um, advisedly. And the reason I think that this is true is because there is a very, very strong tendency in our society to disbelieve the person who is complaining. Um, because not just, uh, uh, not just because of the patriarchy that clouds our brains and our decision making and our societies, but also because there tends to be a massive power imbalance between the person who is making that accusation and the person who is being accused. So where does this take us? This takes us, I think, to a decision-making authority that is not under our Chief Justice, that it is not therefore the anti-sexual harassment committee because section 4 of the notification for example says that that committee will be constituted by the chief justice right so it's not that i think uh, i don't think actually that it should be a junior bench of the supreme court either which is something i thought that maybe that was a possibility maybe a, a sort of bench with a majority of women judges uh, since now we have three women judges in the supreme court um, what the complainant had asked for was a special inquiry committee with retired judges um, and ideally with with a majority of women and um, i think that that would that would be the ideal sort of situation You know, this morning uh, we all saw that a special bench had had been constituted, and it was really quite unconventional. And um, and the CJI did make sort of lots of remarks that maligned, I think, the complainant. And I don't perhaps think that that was, uh, well, I don't think that was appropriate. And the. Uh, the SG and the uh, AG were also sort of joining into that um, and they were also talking about section 16 of the Prevention of Sexual Harassment Act which only really applies to ICC hearings. After that the order that was signed was only signed by two of the judges etc. Now look I can understand that in the absence of a, a mechanism that mistakes are made and that you know when, when people are accused themselves people are very very upset. Um, but this is also where the imbalance of power plays out. I think a really robust NJAC, which is fair, is something that would have addressed this issue because on the one hand you have somebody who is, who has perhaps got legitimate accusations against arguably one of the most, uh, arguably the most powerful person in the country, right? What has happened today is extremely serious and it is, of course, unprecedented. You know, it's a crisis, but it's also a real opportunity to set up a mechanism where if a junior court assistant is harassed by the Chief Justice of India or if an intern is harassed by a Supreme Court judge, then there is that confidence that the young person has that as a citizen, their bodily integrity 
means as much as anyone else's. You also have your, the one thing you have is your reputation if you have been honest. And that reputation and the toxic whispers around that reputation need to be addressed also in a forum that is fair and that is seen to be fair. A forum that does justice. And the one thing I think that we've got to learn from the Me Too movement is this, that the Me Too movement has got to reconstitute our justice systems so that due process is not against the woman complainant, so that due process is actual due process. So due process is something that demonstrates that justice is done.